Okay. Hello and welcome, Facebook family. We're here today at another episode of Seeds of Hope, and with me today is Pearl Osa. Pearl is a homeschooling mom of 10 children, beautiful children. She is Mrs. SA finalist, the author of three books on marriage, dating, and raising children. She is a wife, a YouTuber, her YouTube channel, Life, and Life of Interruptions, and a philanthropist. Welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for having me. We've been trying to schedule this for a while, and I'm so glad to finally be on. I'm so excited, and thank you again for your time. I mean, I, I can't imagine what a schedule must be like in your home. Um, so I really appreciate you carving out the time. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about Pearl. I mean, you are, you have so many roles. You, you do so much in your day. How on earth do you fit it all in? You know what? I, I, I say to people that I am every woman. <laughs> um, some people call me superwoman and I accept the title simply because I realize that that's a title for every single woman that walks the earth. Wow. If she would just step into it, um, you know, because we all see in part and we, we are part of each other. We need each other. So, so no one is a superpower. I was saying to my husband the other day that I, um, I am power. I define myself as power, but I am not all power. Yeah. I am power, but I'm not all power. Um, and I am power because I'm an expression of a delegated power of he who holds all power. So how do I get everything done? I plan. I plan, plan, plan. I organize. I live life in seasons. I always say this is so key. I live life in seasons and I don't force in one season what is meant for another season. And that requires a great deal of contentment to just know I'm not there um, you know, let me, let me put it to you this way. If, if uh, you see an upwardly mobile career oriented woman and she's really about her career and really wants to make something of her life, but she has a nine month period during which she is pregnant, uh, maybe not as physically strong. Um, and then, you know, four months thereafter where she's breastfeeding and she's at home and things are going on in the office and she might've missed that promotion or whatever the case might be. She might tend to look at herself and think that she is a little less in that season, that she has lost opportunities in that season, but it's a season and it's a season in which she has created life and done something so powerful and so beautiful. And when that season is over, she will go back to the office or to her entrepreneurship or whatever the case might be and do that season. So learning to be content in every season and just work it. I'm able to do the things that I can do now because there was a season in which I switched off. I stopped, I paused, I trained my children, I ordered my household. And, and at that time I had friends who had been, you know, in the corporate run with me that were doing great things. And if I looked at that and compared myself, I would think that I was so far behind. But today the season is paying off where I have these children that are able to hold fort when mommy needs to be busy with something. My mother said something really key to me. Long time, I was really, really young and I've never forgotten it. She says that when you want to propel something, you need to pull it back. That she said, this is how she phrased it. She says, no footballer, when he wants to score that um, penalty, stands at the ball and kicks from that position. She says he runs back, gains momentum, and then comes forward with force to kick the ball forward. At that time he's running back, it might seem like a loss of time. It might seem like a drop down the ladder. But when he comes and he kicks and he scores the goal, you will understand that season of having built momentum. So that's how I get everything done, everything in its season, and a recognition of what my everything is and not trying to do anybody else's. Wow, that's really, really powerful. It's something that's going to stick with many of us, I'm sure, um, that wisdom from your mom. So, you know, you, you, you're now in the season of being a finalist in Mrs. South Africa. Tell me, uh, as a woman, how is it, you know, we, we often speak about purpose, quite, you know, it's quite a cliche term, but do you believe you are in your purpose and available to possibilities? Yes, I, I thoroughly am in my purpose because 
um, just me being a mom of 10 homeschooling these children um, and everything else that I've got yeah. going on to it, just in the human mindset, being on this pageant at this time in the season in my life is just impossible. Many people would just, you know, I'd love to do that, but it's just not possible. You know, I've got all these responsibilities. I need to do this. I need to juggle that. The children need me. The husband needs me. It's not possible. And for me to walk this journey in the year that is 2020, like if there was any year where impossible was encapsulated into 365 days, yes. where people got up and thought, I mean, in January the 1st, we were like, yay, 2020. <laughs> and then came COVID. And yes. with that came retrenchment. That came close of business, but that came deaths and sicknesses, but that came divorces, a higher rate of GBV. I mean, this yeah. year was just the year in which yeah. impossible showed us what it looked like. Yeah. And for me to be walking this pageant this year with everything that should tell me it's impossible to do, um, you know, I want to be that emblem of possibility. And, and uh, I remember when my husband and I got married, the first uh, thing that came out of the pastor's mouth, the officiating pastor, he said, your assignment is to go and show the world it is possible. And we've had many little episodes of having to demonstrate possibility. I think the first of those would be just our paths crossing um, the number of children we've had in yes. this day and age and yes. handling all that um, under our circumstances. But to now take that to another platform, I remember in the, in the judging, I was asked, um, why now, why this pageant? How sure am I that I'd be able to handle that with all the other responsibilities? Yes. And one thing that I wanted to really clarify was that the pageant affords me an opportunity to brand that which is my assignment to my generation. I can do it in obscurity, like John the Baptist, I could be in the back room, yeah. in the back of the wilderness, and, and the few people who know me can be wowed by my story. But can you imagine the impact and the power coming out to a platform and saying to every woman everywhere, married, divorced, single, planning to be married, have children, not having children, in the workforce, not in the workforce. I've walked every single one of those yeah. roles. Um, so to say that I'm here, I represent you, I'm relatable to you, you see me, you see yourself. There's nothing I can do or become or achieve that you can't do, become or achieve. My entire assignment is just to show you how great you are by being an example of that possibility. Um, so I avail myself to my purpose. I mean, all of us get a call. Yeah. You either pick up the phone or you don't. Every single one of us gets a call. And the thing with your call is that it will come with inconvenience. It'll come to stretch you. And that's why you either open the door, pick up the phone, or you send someone else and say, tell them I'm not home. The choice really is yours. I've chosen to avail myself to my purpose, particularly for every woman out there. Because I often say, what good is power if it doesn't light up yes. the environment around you? Ask ESCOM. You know, you know <laughs> what it feels like to see generators that don't work. So yes, yes it's all oh, well and good for me to go around and making these powerful statements. I am power, you cannot empower me. That power is useless till it begins to serve. That power is useless till it lays itself down. That power is useless till it connects with other sources of power, till it humbly knows that in and of itself it is useless. I've got this whole plug until you plug it in. There is a source till I'm plugged in, until I serve my community. That power is just futile, it's useless. Yeah, what you're saying is so incredibly, incredibly um, important for us as women. Because, you know, I just had a conversation prior to this interview with somebody and we discussed power and our relationship to power as women. Uh, because oftentimes we find ourselves um, having the identity or under the flag of being vulnerable and not being powerful. And how do we own that power? How have you owned this power with such humility and grace? You know, life will, I don't think I was so gracious and yeah. graceful, if you put it that way, maybe <laughs> in my 20s. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you a, a little story in, in an attempt to answer this one. I used to work for, for one of the big four banks. Um, and after my, my role in the learning and development space, I went into service management yes. and um, I was uh, a regional head of service in one of our regions for the, for the, I don't want to call it the lower end, but just the average retail yeah. banking area. And so one day I'm having a conversation with a, a, a colleague of mine who holds the same portfolio, but for our, 
merchants and investment bankers, you know, yes. the really, really rich, rich dudes, the guys who go out and get a loaf of bread, but come back with a Lamborghini because it's nothing, you know? And, um, and so I was curious to know how they behave because I know in service management, I was being given a tough time by yes. our client. And he was like, no, our guys are so nice. They are so humble. I'm like, it doesn't make sense. How? How is it that when, when, when the average um, earning power of my guys is so much less than yours, but you're having it easy? And he said to me, in the process of making their wealth, they have lived life. Friction has rubbed them and smoothened them. And in the ups and downs and the beatings they've taken to be entrepreneurs, they've just learned to be humble. They've learned that they need the next person. So in my youth, you might not have gotten this vibe from me, mm. but through life, I mean, even with each child, each child will humble you because, yeah. you know, your first child, you're just like, oh, oh. you look at other mothers and, talk and you're thinking that will never happen to me. No <laughs> child will ever talk to me. No, 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 no. Then you get to the 10th one and you realize different personalities yes. and they humble you. When yeah. you become a homeschooling mom and people ask questions, children ask questions and you don't have the answer because that's not your area of, of skill. And having to say, I don't know, I find those to be the three most powerful words. I don't know. I'm yeah. not the source of everything. That in itself is liberating. It is empowering. When you empower others to go look for their answers by themselves, live their best lives by themselves, discover their own purpose by themselves. And I keep saying to my children, I will not always be here. I'll be yeah. here for a long time but I won't always be here. Might not always be here for you yeah. because at some point you're going to have to fly. And, and as painful as it'll be for me, I want to go with you. I want to shield you. I'm going to have to step back. And that empowers me. So I just, one prayer that I've always prayed and I want to, I want to share this. I really want you guys to hear my prayer. I've prayed, Lord, as I increase in graces, help me more importantly to increase in graciousness. What does yeah. that mean? You know, the airs and the graces of a lady and the beautiful dresses and the makeup and the what have you. As I increase in that, do not allow me to ever become the person who does not see the CEO and the security guard in the same light as yeah. human beings that you love, that cannot say sir to both of them, that cannot yeah. say ma'am to the cleaner and say ma'am to the boss lady. Don't allow me to lose my graciousness, my, my relatability. The reason that you've given me that platform is to serve all of these very people, regardless of what walk of life they come from. Yes. And if I ever lose that, just because all of a sudden I can, you know, I can mix and mingle with the who's who and, and the, the breath of my perfume is so alluring and the flow of my dress or whatever else it is I think I've got going on. If I lose hope, because of this graces that I've got on me, that I've lost it all. I pray yeah. that prayer earnestly and regularly. Don't let me lose the graciousness. What good is it if my hands do not hug the way you would have and my yeah. feet do not go to places that you would have where people see me and they're like, okay, I see her and I have hope restored. I know there's a God. I know he must be around what he's done yes. he can do. For me. I, I'm so conscious of that responsibility that I'm just a demonstration of his presence, his power, his love, his compassion, his humility, his meekness. Actually, if we think about it, the word meekness comes from the fact that I have this horsepower in me. Yes. I could go forward, I could push, but I choose to contain myself. That is meekness. Meekness is submission to the goals and aspirations of your fellow human beings. Humility is your submission to God. It's two different yes. things. Yes. And that's why the Bible says, humble yourself under the hand of God. But meekness is in how you relate with each other. So if we look at the person who was considered the meekest man to walk the earth, it was Moses. And Moses had to have God fighting his battles all the time because, you know, his sister would talk to him, you know, any old way. And his brother would talk to him any old way. And even the elders and the people would just be like, oh, you know, go sit down. And when he would want to answer for him, he never wanted to answer for himself. Yeah. And God would have to come out and, 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 you know, cause leprosy to fall on his sister. Um, have to bring out the, the almond trick um, and ask for the sticks to be put in a, in a, in a little box and let's wait and see who's, whose stick is going to bud in the morning to show yeah. you who it is I have called and who I have chosen. Um, and I just want to be remembered that way where I didn't have to fight my own battles. I just went about minding my business, respecting the next person, showing them how great they are. Madiba said something once, he says, greatness is in, pe people know you are great simply because when they come into your aura, they feel great. 
Yes. They, they feel great. Yes. Not that yes. they feel how great you are and feel how intimidated yes. they are to be in your space, but they're just like, oh yeah, I actually, you know, yeah. I'm actually yeah. something yeah. that that's what I want people to come off being in my space. Yeah. And that's what we endeavor to do. We endeavor to create a platform at Seeds of Hope for people to shine and to feel the greatness and for God to shine through them because every individual carries divinity. Every yes. person carries divinity. Mm -hmm. You know? yeah. And how beautiful, how beautiful to have you um, going for Mr. South Africa as a novice. I mean, has it been a steep learning curve for you? Have there been funny stories? <laughs> Yes, they have been very many funny stories. I mean, I remember going in on the day of the of the announcement, yes. and um, I just went as me, you know, because we were going to have makeup ladies do our makeup, and I'm I'm not good with makeup. I'm yes. not really fond of makeup. But it's just a bit a bit much. But um, so we were going to have these ladies do our makeup, and I came like in sweats <laughs> and flip flops. And I'm just like, you know what, um, I'm here. And I, the one lady says to me, you strike me as a diva. And I said to her, far from it, because my understanding of diva is someone who's like, I wanted my way, make yeah. sure my water is this temperature and, you know. And I was yeah. like, no, 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 I'm actually very easy. And she says, no, that's what I mean. I don't mean diva as in difficult. I mean diva as in just have nothing to prove. You're just comfortable. So sometimes I look at myself in the mix and I think that I'm like the... Uh, like I stand out, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm just, I, I feel like I stand out. I'm not having the slits that are really high and, um, and the know-how in, in the Cinderella industry. It's, it's, a, it's a role that many of my sisters have walked and perfected. Some of us haven't. I'm one of those yeah. who haven't. Um, you can just see it when you see me. I, I've got the what you see is what you've got vibe about me. Um, it, there's been very many interesting um, moments in the pageant, and I think one day I'll sit and tell the story. If I told you the stories now, it'll, it'll be it'll be a lot. But I mean, I went in yesterday, and the the ladies didn't know what to do with my hair, yeah, because I don't have the weaves, um, and I didn't have the extra. And it was just like I, I I had a hat on, and I had this unruly afro, and I called the head hairdresser to me. And I said, look me in the eye. I don't want you to, to shift your gaze. I want to see your expression as it changes when I show you what I'm about to show you. And he says, okay, show me. And I take the hat off. And I had little pondos. I had six yes. pondos that I had stretched my <laughs> Very <laughs> untidy. Just sticking all over the show. And I watched his eyes to see um, if he was going to be like, oh, my goodness. Because you're not <laughs> putting heat in my hair. You know, all yes. of the normal Yes. tools of the trade. I was like, yeah, that's not happening here. So how are we going to work this? Um, and he was such a good sport. He was like, oh, no, I'm sure we could do something. So they get this comb. It's a very tiny comb. It's not suited to my hair type. And I told the lady, please don't use that. And when I wasn't watching, she did. And it snapped and broke in my hair. And then she was like, oh, I just broke my comb. And I told her, so you're right, because I told you. Here's an app. I gave her a nice big, <laughs> big Afro comb. So it's all of those stories. Um, but I love that the platform allows you to just be you. Any height, any weight, yes. any look, any color, it really doesn't matter. It's about purpose. Um, so it's a perfect platform for me in this season of my life. Yeah. And how do you see it going forward? I mean, should you t take the title, and I really hope you do, um, you know, what is, what is your dream? What is your aspiration? What is the, the possibilities we can look forward to? Mm -hmm. True. Um, I would just love to take the title to, to another dimension. Um, the current company that runs with the pageant has been at it for about 10 years. It's 10 years now. I think they've done a brilliant job. Um, and, uh, but I do know that no one wants to be doing in 2020 the same thing they were doing in 2010. So yes. I don't say it in any kind of boastful manner that I plan to bring change and to elevate the platform. Um, I would just assume that that is what is expected of me by Mrs. South Africa. Um, and so I would just want to be an ambassador across the realms, you know, um, engage with politicians, engage with business people, engage with the average Joe on the streets, engage with clergy, engage with every community, every um, dimension of our community, anyone that is represented, uh, regardless of race, culture, color, creed, um, I would love to just be the voice for them. Um, take my philanthropic 
pursuits to another level because you know that that sash just opens doors for you mm. and be a voice for those that, that couldn't be a voice for themselves. One of the main drives that I am about is widows. And um, the reason I got on the widows platform was, again, it was a calling. And when I received that call, the assignment was, there's many people who look out for, for orphans. Uh, there's many people who look out for underprivileged girls, underprivileged boys, and they get bursaries and what have you. But do you know that there is a group that did not ask to be in the position that they are in, and those yeah. are the widows. And it was a widow that stood and interceded in the temple up until Jesus was presented at that temple on his eighth day. And she had had to give up her marriage to take that, uh, take that position. But in our community, widows are so badly marginalized. Um, you have a situation where people are not even comfortable to take money from them in a taxi. They have to wear this black. And after the funeral and they've been mourned with, everybody leaves yeah. and they don't socialize. They're not expected to go out. People don't come visit. So do you have any clue how she feels? And worse still, uh, very often in our societies, you'd have the family that was not there um, yeah. when you were building up with your husband. Come out and try and take the house, take the car, while you're trying to figure out how to pay fees for the children, keep yeah. a roof over your head. Maybe go back to work if you've not been working for some time. And now someone comes and says, that belongs to my brother and I'm taking it all. So they go through quite a lot. And I've had a lot of experiences, some of them supernatural to confirm wow. that this was my assignment. I, I not only want to feed them, we're on a feeding scheme now, but I just want to be able to, I know widows who had to go and begin to prostitute themselves yeah. because of economic hardship. I want to empower them to become entrepreneurs and to become so successful that they can pay it forward. Uh, one of the, the, the feeding schemes we did, I remember we got feedback that one of the children said to their mother, Mama, since daddy died, we've not had rice. And, you know, I mean, the thing took me. Yes. This is something we take for granted. Yeah. You know, it's like, all oh, right, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. We would bring them these, you know, big uh, bags of rice and big gallons of oil and, uh, you know, the, all sorts of groceries we would take through to them in partnership with, um, with grocery stores and discount stores and, and our donors. But I mean, that, that, that rice was such a big deal for this family. It broke my heart. We, we took them to dinner the, the one night and, uh, and the one lady said, since my husband died, I've never, no one has wined and dined me. This was like a date, you know? Aww. So it's, it's, it's been all those sorts of things that I want to do that. But I also want to yeah. reach out to child-headed households. We've yeah. got these little girls who, who have to stir a pot of water all night till their siblings fall asleep you know, fooling them that dinner would soon be ready, dinner would soon be ready, but there's nothing to feed them. And they have to prostitute themselves also between school and homework and trying to make the trick uh, yeah. just to put food on the table for two, yeah. three-year-olds. They've been left behind by parents uh, who died through HIV. I mean, the, yeah. the spectrum is, there's just so much we can do. Yes. And I would love to use the rain to do that. And one last thing I want to do with that time on a personal note, having served my nation and yeah. served these constituencies, I want to serve my children with this platform. Because one of the reasons I go after everything I go after is for them to never ever look and say, because we came, mommy stopped. Yes. Because we came, she couldn't be everything she yes. was supposed to be. They would never and can never be an excuse. If yes. anything, they are a reason, not an excuse. They're an investment, not an expense. I've got only one girl. I need her to look at mommy and say, I can do that. Yeah. I can, there's no limit. There's no stopping there's no obstacle. I can be and do any and everything that my creator called me to be. Because yeah. at the end of the day, when we go home and he's taking stock of his investment, I have to yield maximum returns. I have to give him all the dividends. I have to have been worth every sacrifice. Yeah. You know, um, you know, it's so, it's so strange because as you're talking, I'm thinking about my children are, are now young adults, but as they were growing up, and I'm a single mom, I've often traveled. I've had to travel uh, extensively, and I've often traveled. And, you know, one of the things I taught them was to happy miss. We happy miss each other. And, you know, it was oftentimes wow. they would say like, oh, mom, you know, uh, and it was back before FaceTime and all that. So you got this one phone call from a hotel room for three minutes, you know, back, back in 20 years ago. and you know, one of the things that I always said to them, I always said to them, guys, I travel and I love it. I work and I love it. 
And I want you to know that I'm not feeling guilty. This is, I'm not doing this because, I, because oh. of you. I'm not sacrificing because of you. I'm doing this because I love it. And I want you one day to love what you do and to have permission wow. to be passionate about it. You know, and that yes. for me as a woman, because you know, you have all this mom guilt and single mom guilt and, and you know, all the stuff that you, you have to unlearn as women. But it was one of the things that I, that I was mm. deliberate about is that I'm doing this because I'm happy and I happy miss you and you have an adventure and I have an adventure and then we come back together, you know. And, wow. um, and that is my hope for my children as well. So when you speak, I completely, completely get it. I completely get it, wow. you know? Yeah. That's power. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> and, you know, as a, as a mom of, of 10 children, what is, what is your message? What is your, your aspiration? I mean, I'm, I am in awe of you, Pearl. The fact that you are breastfeeding and still doing this pageant, I just want to go like, your baby, you rock, <laughs> you rock. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Wow, wow, wow. I mean, um, yeah. You said, what's my message? What is it? You, yeah, I mean, as I a mom of 10. As a mom of 10, as a mom of two. I mean, with homeschooling, everybody's now had some taste of homeschooling. And uh, a lot of people, oh, you know, it's crazy. So what is your tips for, for moms in this position right now? Um, no one knows your children as, as good as you do. No one knows them as well as you do. No one knows, you know, some sense. We don't always have the full package and understanding of where they're going or what they're going to do. But we, we have an innate feeling for their passions, their desires, their vulnerabilities, um, and their happy spot. And we are their happy place most mm -hmm. times. Not just the home, but the mother in the home. We are their happy place. Yeah. And for a child to be able to learn in their happy place, with their happy place, by observation, they're already learning. You intrinsically are already a teacher. And every yeah. experience is an education. Mm -hmm. So I would say to them, take it in your stride. I find mothers calling me, seeking advice, and they're so panicky because they're trying to be so formal about it. You know, they're acting as if they're the principal of a school. And yes, there are aspects of it that require formality, but I mean, I have school in my bed, you know what I mean? Yeah. And another book that's with breakfast in bed. Um, people sprawled out on the floor by my bedside. There's a table, but at the end of the day, the table doesn't work. They're just not interested. They want to be here. They want to be in my face. I, I have school breastfeeding the one child and teaching the other child. And, yeah. and I find I might have the understanding of the basic theory of what I'm teaching. But that basic theory is going to be taught 10 different ways to my 10 different children. Because when I'm having that conversation, it is just a conversation. Um, and in the midst of that conversation, when I've tried to put it forward this way and do you understand? No, I don't. Then I tap into the personality yeah. of that child and I teach based on the personality and based on the purpose. What do you need to know about this concept? Not what is it about the concept, not what's the theory. What do yeah. you need to know? What's yeah. going to be useful for you to apply? Now, remember that I come from a background in learning and development mm. um, in corporate. And we had two modes of teaching. We had, um, you know, just the basic product knowledge and the policy knowledge and the mm. inductions and, and just the, the we, I called them door stoppers. There was yeah. piles and piles and piles of theory we had to teach you when you came in in order to be able to do your job. But in the midst of that whole thick file, the truth of the matter as human beings in a learning space is when I need to learn something, I'm not going to start from the first page all the way to the end. Yeah. It's like trying to put a DVD together. I go to the page that says instructions. So based on what it is I'm trying to accomplish at that time, I go to the page and paragraph that's teaching me what I need to know. The minute I've got that piece of knowledge, everything else falls into context. The other stuff makes sense. Yeah. When I start with the other stuff first, it confuses me. Yeah. So with this children, what do they need to know based on where they are going and what they're called to be and do? On the basis of that, they assimilate every other piece of information within their context. Wow. I've got a child who's going to be a lawyer. I've got a child who's going to be a doctor. I've got a child who's going to be a musician and, and, and down the spectrum. And I can teach them the same thing. But the lawyer 
buyer takes in that same piece of information from a legal mindset. The mm. businessman from same piece of information, that same mm -hmm. thing in science. He's learning it from a forensic perspective. Like, how do yes. I argue this in court? And the doctor's learning it from how do I save a life? But it's the same piece of information. So don't stress yourself. I know illiterate mothers who themselves have never read a book who have successfully homeschooled. Yes. And have brilliant children go on to go to university. Albert Einstein was in a normal kind of setup in school and had to be taken out of that and brought home to do homeschooling. That's mm. where his genius was unlocked. Yes. Because teaching is not possible without love. If you don't love the subject and you don't love the, the recipient. I teach because there's a passion in me to bring out the best in you. I see your future when I, yes. I teach from that perspective of the future with excitement. If I'm doing it from a place of job, big job, which happens yes. a lot of the times mm -hmm. where, where teachers are just not even showing up in the class. They leave the text, they go away, you know. Then these children come back and some have got it and some have not. But now I'm invested. I'm invested because I say to this child, you are going to one day get me that house by the, by the sea. And I'm not teaching them because I want the house by the sea. But you know what? It's a personal investment and it's a personal journey for me. And, I, and the, it's just to see the lights come on with this child that got something. Oh, it's, it's irreplaceable. So don't be hard on yourself. Don't over plan it. Don't try and be technical. Yes. Don't try and do it in order to please the Department of Education. Do it to teach your child in oh. your stride. You're going to have days. You're going to have days where there's a lot of learning going on. You're going to have days where you know what? Today we're in the garden just drinking lemonade and it's a school day. We're going to have days we're watching CNN as a social studies uh, class and yeah. we're not opening a textbook. Just relax. Wonderful. Wonderful. I think as women, we can be pretty hard on ourselves. Um, so tell me, tell me what's the secret then? You are a mom of 10 children. How on earth did you get your body back? To go into this Mr. South Africa thing. I mean, really now. <laughs> Talk about the impossible. Ah, we, we spoke about this earlier. And, uh, <laughs> I, and, I, and I said, you know, that I, I, I do try and discipline myself. Yeah. Um, I am quite firm with myself with regards to, not just to be in Mrs. South Africa. Um, when I lost weight initially, and I have gained some over the, over the lockdown, but when I lost weight initially, there was no Mrs. South Africa in, in sight. Yeah. Uh, I was doing it for me. I was doing it to be healthy. I was doing it to be around for my children. And I was doing it because part of this brand um, of telling people that it's possible because people just say, children, I'm not going past two. I lose my body. I lose myself. I lose my, no, you don't. No, you don't. If you just are disciplined. I remember once going to a function and at this function, um, there was, there was sandwiches, you know, how they'd have the lined up sandwiches. Yes. There was muffins. There was at the end. Um, in the green room, if that's what you call it. And when I arrived there, people had gone there before me. So they'd had all the nice sweet muffins and the white bread sandwiches were gone. And now they were left brown bread sandwiches and some savory muffins, healthier variety. Mm. And I said, I don't eat that. I don't eat that. And I heard an audible voice say to me, are you not worth looking after yourself? Yeah. Because I used to be about all the unhealthy foods. I, 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 you know, to eat veggies is difficult. To eat fruits is difficult. I just wanted um, breads. I'm, I'm crazy about breads. I've experimented breads from literally everywhere in the world. Portuguese, mm -hmm. French, Indian, Italian. I just wanted to taste breads from everywhere. And that makes you fat. Um, yeah. But it's what I liked. And soft drinks and meats. And just, just don't come near me with anything green. I called it rabbit food. And I heard this voice ask me, this body is a temple. Are you not worth looking after yourself? So yeah. I realized that the choices I've begun to make now in eating healthy were not just because I was getting older, it was because I came to a realization of my worth. And every time I make a choice of eating this versus eating that, it's because I'm investing in myself. So I've lost weight because I'm running around after 10 humans. Um, I'm exercising, I'm yeah. eating, I drink a lot of water. Uh, I think I'm worth it, so I do it. And Mrs. South Africa has now made it contractual. <laughs> it's a contract. That I, have yes. to, <laughs> that I have to keep it all together. But I mean, you'd go there. Well, they don't say you need to be slim. They just say you need to maintain the weight we found you at. Yes. And you go there and you see beautiful, beautiful toned eight pack mamas yes. with babies and eight packs and 
Ooh, I'm like, wow, guys, you guys are an inspiration. Yeah. But I am content with my body, with where it can go to. And I must be honest, I also think I have good genes. Yeah. Um, and I'm healthy. You have people who are much heavier, but they're healthy, maybe healthier. Mm. So the aspiration for any mom has got to be, be in your healthiest place for you and for your children and for your legacy. And if that's slim, wonderful. If it's big, enjoy you. Happiness is the greatest weight loss program. Yeah. Yeah. And also, they are so if you are pregnant, enjoy being pregnant, you know, and, you know, at that time of thing, exactly, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, I mean, you've written a lot about marriage, dating, raising children. What, are, what, is, what is your golden thread? What is, what is key to, to keeping it all together as a family? Purpose. Purpose preserves. Yeah. Um, so I often say to people, we, a family exists in the pursuit of purpose and destiny. If you look at the scripture, you would hardly find, you know, a dating scenario where a guy saw a girl, he was like, oh, you're cute. You know, yes. Let's do this. And, yes, let's uh, go to Tinder. Very ready. <laughs> <laughs> very ready. I think maybe in the story of, uh, of Jacob when he cited Rachel. Yes. Um, yes. And I, yes. I know one other very great love story we're told of in scripture was Rebecca and Isaac. But even that was not because he went out, found her and chose her by himself, but purpose and destiny chose her for him. Yes. If you think of the very first love affair, Adam opens his eyes and there's his bride. And yes. he, he resonated. He, she had come from me. A bone had been taken and she had been forked. But I didn't um, start with love. And I know every time I say this to people, they're just like, no, that's so old fashioned. Love is not the starting point for marriage. Purpose is. Wow. Love is what keeps marriage going. Love is a decision in any case to wake up every day, show up and do the right thing. It's a decision. And that's how people come to a place where they say we're no longer compatible. Compatible actually comes from a Latin word, which means to suffer together. And so I cannot suffer you any longer. But as I said earlier, when we started this discussion was that purpose will come from the furnace. It will come from, from what will drill you and break yes. you and make you suffer. And you need to be willing to sacrifice for that because that's the very reason for which you were born. Like for Christ, it was his passion, you yes. know, born to die, to, to rise again. So um, when we're coming into marriage, just like in a, in a company, you can go to work every day, work with colleagues you don't like. Think about it. Yes. You don't like them but we've got a strategy to accomplish. We've got a boss to answer to. Yes. And you know what? While we're at it, there's a bonus that I'm working towards. So if I need to like you, if we need to do coffee for me to get my bonus at the end of the year, I want that 13th check. I will do what is necessary. It's the same thing with marriage. There is a CEO of an organization mm. um, and he pulled a, a team together. When you look, at, you, you look at your organizational plan, you see the gaps, you deep determine what needs to be done to fill that gap. You draw a job description to that effect yeah. and you go and hire. It's the same thing with us in marriage. God looked on the earth and decided there was something he wanted to do. He said, let's make man in our image and let him have dominion. So it's an extension of a domain of a king dumb. Yes. And the team that needed to be put together to extend this agenda or extend this kingdom happened to be man and wife for this yes. cause. There has to be a cause. For this cause, shall a man leave his mother and father? Where there is no cause to bring him, there will be no cause to keep him. And, and, and God is so kind, I think, that when you have obeyed the call, there's a story in scripture uh, of, a, of, of, of a lady by the name of Aksa. I love the story. Aksa yes. is the daughter of uh, Caleb. And Caleb was a, a leader of war, as you would know after yes. Joshua. Yes. So they've gone and they've gone on, on these wars and, um, and he takes stock and he realizes they've not conquered all the, the territories they were supposed to conquer. And um, he's like, no, there's still a few territories to be taken. So he calls yes. the young men. He says, whoever will go on and fight these wars that are necessary um, can have my daughter's hand in marriage. He did not ask his daughter's permission. He did not ask her opinion. She was the price given by a father to one who would take on the cause of the nation. Yes. And we are told she 
well, she, she was the prize. She went along with her husband. Now, when they get on this journey of marriage, she looks around, they've given her land. It's dry. There's no water. There's no way to make a life. Yeah. She goes back to her father. She doesn't complain to her father beforehand. She goes to her father after the fact. And she says, the land you've given to us has no water. And he says, I will give you the upper and the lower streams too. She received double for entering into marriage for the sake of purpose. Seeking purpose first, uh, a Matthew 6, 33 mindset. You know, seeking the kingdom first and knowing that all these other things. Well, so added. all these other things were added on to her. We've got a problem now where people are coming into marriage, looking for their way, looking for their things, looking to make themselves comfortable. They're in marriage because if they hear one more church mama say to them, ah, how long are you going to be single? If they hear one more person say, I want grandchildren. This is what's pushing people into marriage. Aww. And so they're getting in there. They're not compatible. They don't know his purpose. They don't know his plan. He can't lead them anywhere. They're just in marriage. If we get the order right, God is faithful, I believe, to then add onto you all these other things, such as happiness, wow. love, companionship, yeah. attraction to each other, children, wealth, with which to accomplish the purpose you've been sent to do. But we're getting it the wrong way around. So that's just my counsel to those thinking of being in marriage or those already in it. Wow, that's quite profound. That's quite revolutionary, actually. And, and so true. And so true. And it is so true. Um, it's a, almost a, 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 a divine kingdom covenant uh, that needs yes. to happen first. That needs to happen first. Yeah. And tell me, you know, we, we're almost at the end of our hour together. And it's flown by so quickly. Um, I've really enjoyed chatting to you. I really have. Um, tell me, what, um, what is your message of hope for us as South Africans? South Africa, you've been world. through worse. <laughs> yeah. We've been through worse. If we could conquer and we could stand here and be an example for the rest of the continent, be the go-to location and destination for the continent, if we could do that, there's nothing we cannot do. We are by very nature an adaptable, loving, embracing, and kind people. This is the yeah. nation that we are. Yeah. We can do all things. We can do all things. This will just be another step that, you know, took us up to that place that we are called to be in the world. We know that the end time revival is going to come from this nation. We know that the eyes of the world and the eyes of heaven are upon South Africa. So much is dependent on you, South Africa. Your children, your older ones, your men and your women are an example that the world has looked at. And they keep on asking, yeah. how, how did you do it? We're not a rainbow nation for nothing. We're a rainbow nation because the rainbow is a sign of covenant. And God himself has a covenant with this land. And he will not take his finger off of the pulse of South Africa till he has accomplished that, which he set off to do with us. We are more than conquerors, guys. So 2020 is going to come and go. COVID is going to come and go. We're already coming out. Yeah. Yes, we hear that COVID is not over in the rest of the world. And we know that things have escalated back in South Africa and it's not over. We are still called to be responsible. Nevertheless, we are a people of resilience. We are a yeah. people who are already, you know, putting our minds to a post-COVID economy, a post-COVID reality, post-COVID families. We can do this. Yes, we have faults and we must address them and fix them just in terms of how we see women folk, how we treat our children, um, and so many other myriads. But the thing is, at the core of it, we're a strong and beautiful people. We got through it before, we'll get through it again. Oh, thank you, Paul. Thank you so much. That is just so, so inspiring, so inspiring, and gives us so much hope. Um, I'm going to, before I say goodnight to everybody, is there anything you'd like to add, anything that we've missed, any points that you'd like to make before we close for the evening? Firstly, I just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to sit and talk with you. I've watched you from afar. I saw your TED Talk. I know your powerful story, or at least whatever part of it you have shared with the world. And so for me, it's a privilege to join you tonight and join voices with you to reach your constituency and your platform. Thank you so much. I don't take it for granted. For everyone who sat and listened through this hour, thank you so much for your time. 
I don't want you to walk away from this conversation and think, oh, Pearl, oh, Mm -hmm. wow. I want you to walk away from this conversation and think, oh, me, oh, wow. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I've got it in me because the one who made her made me and he has no favorites, you know, so I can do this. And I want you to just sit down and revisit that vision board, revisit your plan. The year does not determine your plan. The year is but a speck in the big spectrum of time. It comes and it goes. So 2020 was not a waste. And we're in the 11th month now. It's the 11th hour. The, the master is still coming to the marketplace and looking around at those who've been sitting there and waiting. You might've been waiting for a job. You might've been waiting for an opportunity. You might've been waiting for a child, for a marriage, for a friend, just for a hand out, you know? And I want you to know that you could still hold on to hope because if in the 11th hour, someone can get pulled into the fold and listen to this, get the same reward as those who've been there from the first hour because the creator understood it was not his fault that he didn't get picked the first time. I want you to know that any situation you're going through that is not your fault was there just to build you, to strengthen you, to give you the rest you need to push in and work in that last hour. So in this last hour of the year, in this last hour of a COVID situation, let's join hands together as a nation and as people, just people, human beings everywhere, be kind to one another, be kind to yourself. Heave yourself up that couch right now and say, I can still make it work, it's not late. God bless you, keep you, cause the space to shine upon you. Love you much. Love you plenty. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Oh, and may God continue to bless you. Thank you so much for carving this time. I am so privileged and we are all rooting for you. Thank you for, thank for you. just, you know, when I look at you and I look at all that you're doing and all that you are, I want to say I am possible. I'm inspired yes. to be possible, to, to follow my dreams, yeah. to be reignited, to be re-energized yeah. in this 11th month. I also want to go like, no, I can't forget that dream. I can't forget that whisper of God, you know? And, um, yeah. and I pray, listeners and Facebook family, that you will find that in you, that you will go after your purpose with passion, with excitement, with just unlimited joy and may hope always light your way. God bless you. God bless you. Bless you. Bye.